All right. All right. Um, thanks for coming. Welcome to the September Bay Area Rust Meetup. Um, thank you, Mozilla, for giving us this space. Um, the food this time is provided by, provided by Google. Thanks, Google. Um, today we uh, today we have two talks. Um, first is by Jane on her um, experiences navigating the Rust open source community. Uh, this is a kind of a preview of the talk she's going to be giving at Colorado Gold Rust next week. Uh, Colorado Gold Rust next week. Uh, tickets are still open if you want to go. Um, and then we have Adam Perry, who is kind of also doing a conference talk, except this is a, a version of a talk that he gave at RustConf uh, last, a couple weeks ago at this point. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you all. Um, welcome, Jane. So welcome everyone, thank you. Um, the talk today is Navigating the Rust Open Source Community. My name is Jane, as you already mentioned. My tag online is Yasi. Um, I will be your guide today. So quick disclaimer, uh, Manish, had, when he invited me for this talk, he did not know exactly what was gonna be in it and it shaped out to have a lot of nice things to say about him. Um, <laughs> so it's purely a coincidence. Nothing to see here, moving on. Okay, so what's this talk all about? There's a couple of goals in this talk. First, I wanna help new contributors who are looking to get involved in the open source community, figure out how to navigate and find issues to work on and get involved and get connected. Second, I wanna help established maintainers who are trying to look for people to contribute to their project know how to structure it in such a way that it's easier to get into, there's not as much friction, and how to find people and like what works for getting people involved, or what worked for me at least. What I'm not gonna do in this talk is talk about how to learn Rust. There's lots of great people who are doing that already. I'm gonna try and help you find them, not be that person today, but hope, this talk is just gonna be about the community side of Rust, not the technical side. So, a quick about me. Um, my name is Jane Lesby, again and again. Um, I'm a C++ developer at Scale Computing. It's a clustered virtualization company and I work on distributed storage. Um, I have been working on C++ professionally for six years now. Uh, I was introduced to Rust in early 2018 at one of the Hacker Nights and fell in love. I quickly got to the point where I wanted to contribute to the open source community. I had actually wanted to do that for a long time in general, but Rust actually got me there. Um, whereas no one else had really, and I'm going to talk about basically why that happened. The first thing was the code of conduct. Now, when I was looking into the Rust language, the code of conduct was all over the place, and let me just give you a little more background about myself. In case it's not obvious, I'm a woman, I am also gay and transgender, so when I come into a community space, I worry about things like misogyny, homophobia, and transphobia. So see, coming into the Rust community and seeing that they explicitly want to protect people of varied gender identities, race, ethnicity, disability status, and other similar attributes was like a weight off my shoulders. Um, I, I, it, what it really gave me was a sense of safety. I felt like I could engage and not worry about someone harassing me, or if someone did harass me, it felt like the community would have my back. Um, luckily, in the two years that I've, almost two years that I've been involved, um, I haven't had any bad experiences, and I think that's also largely to think, to, or largely due to the code of conduct. It acts like preventative medicine and prevents the type of people who, you're, who it's designed to prevent or protect against from ever getting involved in the first place. So, one takeaway here is mentioning the code of conduct and that you you explicitly abide by it in your projects can have a really it can be all the difference between someone being comfortable to engage and not being comfortable to engage. So that got me excited about Rust, but that wasn't really what got me involved in Rust. What really got me involved in Rust was this week in Rust. So now if you're not already familiar with it, the Rust community maintains a weekly newsletter that contains things like blog posts, the create of the week, call for participation, which is just a list of issues that you can take on, um, merges, changes to core, upcoming meetups and job postings, and sometimes a funny quote at the end. Um, I came for the blog posts because like, I was obsessed at the time. I wanted to 
absorb any information I could find about Rust, but what really had the biggest impact was the call to call for participation section. Um, I have ADD, and so I like when I, I've been wanting to do open source work for a while, but my brain's always like later, later. It's this big scary thing. Getting involved is work, and work is hard. But here's this week in Rust, just every week, waving a flag of friendship, being like, hey, here's something you can work on. Just do it. And eventually, one of the issues looked approachable enough, and I did it, and I got my first contribution into Rust-C. It was just cleaning up some test files that were getting polluted into the code base. But really, get, being able to get involved and learn the process made it a lot less scary. One more thing about this week in Rust is it is dependent on the community to function. So it used to be the case that the maintainers who mainly manage it would go and pick issues that looked interesting and put them in this week in Rust, but they don't do that anymore because they don't want to be unfairly biased towards any one project. So nowadays, they rely entirely on people coming with issues that they want other people to work on in order to get them in that list. And if you look at the old posts and the new posts, there's a lot fewer issues nowadays, and that makes me personally pretty sad. And so what I want is I want people to do a better job leveraging this week in Rust and submitting their, idea, their project things that they have to work on to it. And if you don't already subscribe to it, you absolutely should. So I, do, I got past the point where I was scared, and now I was ready to dive in and try and find issues to work on. And I ran into a couple of problems. There was some friction. The first issue was the issue boards were pretty difficult to navigate at times. I would go and filter by good first issue, and I would see issue after issue. I would go into issue after issue and see that someone else had already claimed it or someone had mentioned that they claimed it and hadn't done anything for a, month, for a while. And eventually I just settled on only looking at issues that had no comments in them, which isn't the greatest system because it's pretty common for people to like open an issue and then one of the developers to leave a mentorship post explaining how it works. So I didn't even get any of those. The second issue was sometimes a lack of feedback or slow response times. I remember distinctly one time leaving a comment on an issue, like very shyly being like, hey, would it be okay if I can take this issue? And waiting two days for a response and kind of like overthinking it, freaking out a bit. And eventually I just deleted the comment and tried to find somewhere else because like I was too stressed about it. And I don't want this to come off like I'm complaining about open source maintainers not being responsive because they're doing community service. They have no responsibility and you shouldn't expect work out of them. But that doesn't change the fact that it kind of sucks when you're trying to get involved and you're not hearing anyone talk back to you. And I, I have some ideas for how we can make it a bit easier. Um, and if you want to talk about it, come after the talk. But I'm not going to get into it right now. But I ended up settling on a couple of repos, specifically Clippy, Rust, Fix, and Cargo, where the maintainers were responsive and friendly and amazing. I just want to give a special shout out to Pascal, Manish, Ollie, Phil, Kenny, Philip, and Eric for putting up with me and helping me do my code reviews and all of that and making it a pleasure to work with. So this one is probably not as much of a surprise for you guys, but meetups were a big breakthrough for me. Um, I didn't know they existed. And actually, when I was researching this talk, I realized that we're the, this specific meetup group is not yet doing a good job about posting our, our meetups in the This Week in Rust newsletter, which is why, despite having a meetup section, I didn't know about it. Um, but I'm going to try and help fix that. Um, but I heard about the meetups from my friend and signed up and started going to all of them. And for a while, not a lot really happened. I was going to the meetups. I was enjoying the talks. I was enjoying the food. I was sometimes being social. I'm really shy. So it's like kind of hard to go out of my way to engage. Um, but I was enjoying it, and I kept coming. But it wasn't until the meetup at Google where I really had a breakthrough. And the thing that happened is it seems, it seems trivial, but Manish just came up to me and said, hey, you're Jane, right? And I was shocked. I was like, how does Manish know who I am? Like, I felt, at the time, I felt like I hadn't done anything worthy of notice. And yet here was Manish asking me for me, like one of the core team members of Rust, the person who runs the meetups, was asking for me by name. And so I was like, yes, yes, I'm Jane. And you're Manish, right? And he's like, yeah. And he just wanted to thank me for my contributions I'd done to Clippy and say, if you wanted to get involved some more, I'd be happy to mentor you through more issues. And let me tell you, like that simple outreach um, has probably had a more profound positive effect on my life in the last year than anything else in the last two years. 
I probably wouldn't be here today if it weren't for Manish and his just friendliness. Um, it wasn't the only thing that happened at that meetup. I also, after or the talk was by Eliza Weissman on tracing, and the it ended up being extremely relevant to the systems I work on, and I brought that talk back and basically gave a simplified version of it for my work, and now we're adding a bunch of those features to our project. And also, after the talk, I was sitting there kind of, as always, shyly, vaguely hoping someone would talk to me, and Adam saw me and was like, hey, you look like you want someone to talk to you. Why don't you come and sit with us? And so he introduced me to Izzy and Rain, and that was like, that was the kind of, for me, um, when I first got like Rust friends. And that was the moment when I really felt like, <laughs> I feel like the crying makes it better, but it's still embarrassing. <laughs> okay. But that was the moment for me when it felt like I'd finally joined the Rust community. Um, Manish and everyone else will tell you that I was already a member. It doesn't really change how it made me feel. So before I even left the meetup, I, text, I found Manisha's username on the, get, on the Discord and I sent him a message. I was like, yes, 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 I want you to mentor me. Like, this is, I was extremely excited about having someone to help me get more involved because I really wanted to do the work. It was just sometimes hard to like, actually motivate to do it. And so I went home more excited than ever and I had a bit of a, kind of, I think, a misunderstanding of what a mentor is. What I, was, what I kind of expected and wanted at the time was basically a manager someone who would find things for me to work on and check in and help me like stay on topic and get as much work done as I wanted to get done. Um, but, and he did do that, though I, in retrospect, I think that was a lot to ask because like, that is a job. Um, <laughs> but what he really offered was much more than that. Um, importantly, he was a constant source of encouragement uh, I would talk to him about things that were on my mind. Like I talked to him about how excited I was about tracing and how I wanted to get involved in that project. But I was, com I was massively intimidated by Eliza at the time. And Manisha's like, no, just go talk to her. She's friendly. You'll, it'll be great. You'll have a great time. And he was totally right. I, I got involved. I've learned more from that project, especially about like high things like unbound lifetimes and generics and rest than I have from any other project. Um, I would also come and talk to him about like random features that I wanted and basically or complain to him about the bike shed of the moment. Um, and this was, he kind of gave me advice on basically like to, in this case it was just to write a blog, like share your thoughts, like this is a good idea. And in this, in this specific case it was about uh, A-weight syntax and uh, I had opinions but not specifically about A-weight, I just wanted post-fix macros. Um, but he was, he encouraged me to write my, write a little blog post about it. I felt ridiculous at the time because I didn't write any async code. So I'm like chiming into this massive bike shed and just making it worse. But he encouraged me to do it anyways. And I'm glad he did. I feel a lot more comfortable blogging now and sharing my thoughts and I've been doing it. In addition to that, I was, because he's been trying to convince me to give a talk at one of these meetups for a while. He wanted me to do a contribution tour and kind of talk about all the things I've done. Um, and so I've been practicing talks at work and he gave me the idea to write the talk as a blog post first, which has really helped. Like, it, like every time I tried to do one of these talks, it was like this unapproachable task, but writing a blog post for some reason is a lot easier. So I write it out and then I just turn it into a blog post or into slides and it works great. Um, speaking of complaining about features that I want, uh, Manish fundamentally under changed my understanding of how to approach open source work. Prior to this, I had been just going out and finding issues to work on, and, but mostly doing things that other people had said, here, you could do this. Like, not necessarily, th necessarily things that I was personally interested in. But whenever I came to him with like, things I wanted in cargo or things I wanted in like, some random library, he was like, hey, you should go like, work on it. That's a great idea. And it really was a lot more satisfying to work on something that I cared about and something that someone else thought was important. Like I got to m make feature or implement features that I was going to use and using them is like way more satisfying than just like writing something then forgetting about it because you don't really care about it. And it ends up feeling like a much more sustainable approach to open source to work on things you personally care about. So I got a bit 
overzealous at this point. I like had all this energy and this excitement and this approach, and I opened a lot of issues and worked on a couple of things at once. I opened three PRs at once on Cargo, coded them all up. I thought they were great, submitted them, and Eric came back with the review. And it was way more work than I expected that needed to be done. And it was, it was really intimidating. Like, I, I kind of got paralyzed for a few weeks and did nothing because I saw like, all this stuff that I had suddenly felt like I had committed to. And it took me a moment to realize that I could actually just not work on some of them for a while and come back to it later. And I broke up my tasks into little tasks and I learned my limit. I learned not to bite off more than I could chew. For me, it's one open source issue in addition to work. Another problem or I was having once I got really excited was uh, I kept on telling people about things I wanted, but I wasn't writing them down very often. And Eliza was the one who actually helped me with this one. She, every time I would complain to her about something on tracing, she's like, open an issue. And then I would complain, I would not open an issue sometimes. And then I'd complain that I forgot something and I knew I'd forgot something. And she was like, well, you we should have opened the issue. And eventually that sunk in and I started opening issues, not just on tracing, but every project that I had an idea for, just go to their, GitHub repo and open an issue. And it's got the benefit of sometimes people do your work for you, which is amazing. Um, but now I have all these issues lying around and I was kind of losing track of them, so I needed to find a way to organize them. And I actually got the inspiration for this one from David Tolney. He wrote a blog post and published it via DocsRS. And I thought that was brilliant and was like, hey wait, I can use a GitHub repo to track all the other issues from the other GitHub repos. And so I opened one, initially I just used an issue, but it turns out when you put a link to another issue in an issue, it mentions it in the other one. So I kept on like having little notifications saying, Jane put you in PR ideas, Jane put you in PR ideas. And that was a little embarrassing. So I settled on a project board because it's nice to organize and it doesn't notify anyone. So this next one might be a little controversial, but uh, it, Manish and Eliza introduced me to Twitter accidentally. Uh, it was the A Wait post, actually, that kind of did it for me. Manish was like, when, when I wrote the post, he's like, here, you should post it on Twitter and I'll retweet it. And Twitter had never really like, clicked for me before then. Um, I was an avid Redditor for 10 years, but like Twitter, just following people didn't make sense. But it was at that moment I was like, I could follow people who talk about Rust. And that, that suddenly is like, okay, I'm gonna do that. And I followed everyone I could. And I realized that com the way that people communicate on Reddit and Twitter are fundamentally different. Like Reddit's great for threads, it's great for keeping up on news, but it's not a very personal form of discussion. Like you only have the little username and sometimes people change it. Like it's one step away from being anonymous. Um, Twitter on the other hand, you follow individual people, you, you make friends, you talk to people. And there's the picture, there's multiple names. It's a lot easier to kind of remember someone and like make friends. And I have made many more friends in the community from Twitter than Rust, like hundreds on Twitter and zero on Rust or on Reddit. So if you want to meet people, I definitely recommend using Twitter and just following every Rustation you can find. Um, and then the last thing, this one hasn't really fully panned out because it's literally being encouraged to give a talk. So we'll kind of see how this affects me in the long term and I'll make sure to write a blog post about it afterwards. But um, so Manisha, I mentioned earlier, Manisha had been trying to get me to do one of these meetup talks and I, I, was, I wanted to, but I didn't really feel like I was ready yet. I didn't feel, it's the same thing, like imposter syndrome, I didn't feel like I'd done anything important. Um, and then Jay came along and they were like, hey, I see all this stuff you've been doing. We have a, I was wondering if you would be interested in submitting a talk proposal for Colorado Gold Rust. And I was interested. I was terrified, as always, but very interested. And so I told them about all the things that I was worrying about and how I was afraid of like, the process. And I didn't want to, like, I didn't know if I'd be able to get a whole talk done in time. And they were like, no, you just have to have an outline. And they, they were like, they helped me through all of my fears and made the, the whole process seem much more approachable. And so I said, yes, I'll do it. And I promptly procrastinated for weeks. And thankfully, that didn't stop Jay. They came back and were like, hey, you, you doing okay? Do you still want to do the talk? I'm like, yes, I do want to do the talk. It's just really hard to actually do this. It's scary. And they like kept giving me this helpful, calming encouragement and got me to do it. When if, if it weren't for them, I definitely would have just waited past the, the time window when I could submit and then beat myself for it afterwards. So the key takeaways of this talk are if you have a project, mention the COC in it. It'll help people engage. 
Leverage This Week in Rust, either follow it, or if you have issues you can post in it, post the issues. Um, go to meetups and conferences, you're already obviously doing the first. Um, get or be a mentor. I feel like mentorship had a profound impact on how involved I got, and so I feel, really feel like everyone should have that opportunity and should help the other people around them grow in the same way. Um, open issues, know your limits, keep organized, use Twitter, do outreach. Um, I think you get the picture. So I'm gonna take one minute to do a quick shameless plug. Manisha's mentorship inspired me to start an awesome list of people who are interested in mentoring. Um, if you are interested in mentoring or want a mentor, you should definitely check it out. That's it. Any questions? No? Okay. On the scale of awesome to amazing, where does my niche lie? <laughs> it's it's the union of them both. Repeat the question. Oh, yeah. On a scale of awesome to amazing, where does my niche lie? No. Okay. <laughs> So Rain asked, on a scale of awesome to amazing, where does Manish land? And I said, the union. You've got to combine them both. He's of awesome <laughs> and amazing. <laughs> Thank you. You can't really embarrass me like that just before I have to come up here. That's just not done. <laughs> but uh, thank you, Jane. Um, yeah. Um, Adam? I'm, I'm just going to move. <laughs> I agree that Manish is pretty great. <laughs> um, and now we get to see whether all those years in IT before I learned how to code are going to pay off. How's everyone doing tonight? That's great to hear. It's a little warm in here, isn't it? Okay. It's always the way of it, isn't it? Am I, uh, am I on this thing? Is it on? No, it's always the way of it. <clears throat> Sorry. I'm muttering because I'm tinkering. Uh, Manish, help. What do I do? You put the thing in the thing and then the thing works. <laughs> yeah, the thing is on. It says podium laptop. Okay. Oh, hey! All the things are on. Almost. Almost all the things are on. Okay. Oh, oh, no, this, it's the cable. It's the cable. Isn't it the cable? Yes, it's, okay, I'm just not going to touch it. But I, well, except for the, using the laptop. Um, <laughs> thanks for bearing with me. So, uh, a piece of advice for the Manishas of the world. Uh, if you tell someone that you'd like them to give a talk, don't tell them to be lazy. Uh, and another piece of advice for people who are giving talks, like the Adams of the world, Get really excited about things you can present at a meetup. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Listen to Jane. Mm -hmm. So I uh, have been doing a lot of hacking and didn't quite plan my deceleration for slides prep. So we've got a couple of strike throughs and a, I'll do a little VS Code navigation. But I've also been informed another critical mistake on Manisha's part, again, my apologies, that I have a lot of time. Um, <laughs> so let's get started. <laughs> uh, so I won't belabor this too much. I'm not anybody that you should know, really. Uh, Rust has been really important for my personal and professional development um, for actually a lot of reasons that sound really familiar to, to Jane's stories. Um, in fact, I found Twitter as like my Rust social home for a while uh, because the Rust Off Topic IRC channel turned into a flaming pile of politics uh, a few years ago. And Twitter was a great place to find people talking about all the stuff that I cared about without having to deal with that. Um, so, I'm pretty stoked about Rust. I think it has a significant role to play in the future of computing. Um, oh, that actually reminds me that I'm, I'm not saying this as a representative of my employer, and this is not related to anything that I do for work, although um, it is a lot of fun to, to do some Rust at work. Um, and uh, before doing a little bit of Rust at work, I worked on React Native developer tools at a startup uh, and got a little nerd sniped, you might say. You might say. I uh, saw a lot of potential, and I still see a lot of potential in, um, in the direction of that technology. I think, you know, they, 
they didn't build it in Rust, right? And of course, none of the infrastructure to build it in Rust exists or even remotely does. Um, and so I think like, you know, there might be a role to play for, for Rust in, in the world of future, you know, UI abstractions and, and tools. Um, I'd like to explore that, but also I'm probably very wrong about a lot of things. Uh, I don't actually build apps. I mean, part of the reason why I'm doing this is because I'm really picky and I would like to. Um, and that also means that I need to learn a lot from people who do. You know, I see a bunch of interesting, really technical problems when it comes to, uh, to interface work, to interactive applications. I think as people interested in important details of the execution of programs, we often underestimate just the sheer amount of complexity that goes into like the human interfaces before it gets to code that a lot of us are writing day to day. Um, and that's a lot of complexity that requires a lot of learning, like I said. And one of the ways that I can learn is if you show me how I'm wrong with projects, come write code. We've got to figure some of this stuff out. Um, so when I say I want to write apps in Rust, what do I mean? Um, I mean, I think if we're talking about Rust, we generally have some notion of like, I write cargo build dash dash target and all the magic happens. Um, and I think that, you know, essentially if you're, uh, actually before, before I talk about, you know, what that implies for our efforts, right, trying to build reusable things, um, I just want to point out when I was looking for screenshots of AOL email login, this is what I found. I, just, I think it's nice if we can all soak in the beauty of our world for a second. Um, <laughs> If you can re can't read this, uh, it says, uh, today's email inbox looks significantly different from the AOL inbox of yore. Make sure your email marketing has grown with the times. And it's tagged with blockchain technology, <laughs> business innovation, and thought catalog. Um, okay, so human interfaces, right? Call them GUIs, UIs, whatever. But like the stuff that people touch, the things that we put on screens. Um, if you want to be able to just cargo run, that's actually like a really big engineering artifact. That's like civilization at work in all of the existing instances of it we have today. Um, you know, for context, right, like here's the Mac OS attempt at it, or at least their box diagram of some of the pieces that go into that. You don't have to read any of that. My point is that there's a lot. Um, here's like a listing of things that go into the application of, or the architecture of an Android application if you use like the more modern Jetpack framework, which is pretty cool. Um, and, you know, if you, if you look through the API docs, like maybe half are related to actually things on the screen, but they all have to understand the way that that happens, right? They're all of the Android flavor. And it's the same for the Mac OS flavor. Um, and if you want to be like aggressively cross platforms, you can just pick something up, you know, and run with it and target a bunch of different platforms all at once. Like this is Flutter's um, architecture diagram. I think it's a really nice architecture diagram. For one thing, it tells you everything you need to abstract an operating system away to build an application. Um, and it also tells you like each of these boxes, you know, the event loop interop, that's a crate. Thread setup, one, maybe more. Dart isolate setup, well we don't have a dart crate, but you know, if you had a scripting language attached to your UI, you would probably have a few crates in there. Gestures, multiple crates, painting, 20, who knows? These are like complex pieces of software, each of them, and they all have to interoperate. Um, and I think those technical realities of that complexity are part of why we have large frameworks like this typically, right? Um, and if, of course there is kind of this exception that like, people kind of compose their own application framework on the web. Um, and the web's really cool. It's like the only thing of its kind in all of history and may forever be, who knows. Uh, but it also, because of its very cool properties of backwards compatibility, has a difficult time serving everyone's needs all the time. It can take a long time for it to achieve good performance for certain kinds of interactions. And like, if you look at the global population of people using devices, they're often pretty poorly served by the mobile web. So I don't think it can be the only thing that a community bets on um, if you want to be like building applications for everyone. Uh, and I think, you know, if you look at the size of these engineering projects, aside from the web, which you can kind of write a library really quickly for, I've already done that, um, you know, it means that something that's like flutter scale isn't coming with Flutter polish 
that soon, at least by my by my standards. I think that there are multiple really, really, really exciting, like pure Rust native GUI efforts happening, and I want to write boxy bindings for all of them. Um, that's the name of the project I'm talking about tonight. Uh, but I think that like to target, you know, desktop, mobile, web, embedded stuff that people might want to write UI for. Who knows? The kinds of the, the breadth of targets that Rustations tend to want to embrace. It's just really hard. It's just a big task. It's just a lot of big tasks and coordinating them is hard. And we're gonna like do that as a community. But I think that basically, um, and bear with me, this is aspirational. Uh, I think we can kind of digest this incrementally. Like I think we can push forward on pure Rust experiments, projects, pursuits, I think, um, like Druid in particular has shown lots of really exciting stuff happening and OrbTK has a bunch of great demos and they have like a whole desktop environment. Um, Azul looks really cool. The, the Iced renderer looks really cool. So like these are all vital and important for our community to do. Um, but we can't only invent if we want to like ship stuff. At least if we want to ship stuff in the near term. Um, and so this is why I think that kind of exploring uh, a you know libraries not frameworks approach is interesting, um, and I think that with Rust we actually have some kind of historically unique ingredients for doing this with respect to like complex apps that you hold in your hand. Right, um, we have a community that really values deep research. I didn't put this on the slide, but you know like people who think a lot about problems and experiment a lot, and you know. Um, there, there's a place for that in our, in, our, in our circles. And we distribute those artifacts that they create. And we have a type system that makes it really easy to build abstractions on top of them and to do so with low overhead. Um, and I think that, you know, if you look at the critical performance properties of lots of UIs, uh, you know, the scaling factors that make, you know, frameworks necessary, might, we might be able to kind of relax those a little bit for Rust might be able to, to shard the work a little more. Um, and so my aspiration uh, is that if we start with, you know, bindings to big projects, while we have a bunch of these exciting uh, efforts going on, that, you know, we can kind of build, uh, like, Rust applications and also pave the way for the future. Um, and I think that concretely what that looks like in practice is a bunch of code that you can use no matter the context. Right? Or at least across several contexts which you care about. Right? Uh, and so I've been making a bunch of attempts at this for a while. Uh, this is the one that seems worth sharing, uh, calling it Moxie. Originally, I wrote a JSX styled macro that I called Mox because it made a mockery of XML. <laughs> and this seemed like a fun project name. Um, and so uh, the buzzword soup that you see on the right uh, is like my attempt at distilling what I think one really interesting piece of critical infrastructure for Rust community UI projects might be, uh, which is like a, a UI runtime. If you're familiar with uh, React, that's like the, the kind of niche in the ecosystem that they intend to occupy. Um, I think that like the Rust answer to this uh, part of an application is probably you know lower level, a little bit less opinionated, et cetera. So this is kind of my attempt at, at playing with that. Um, and uh, let's you know maybe dive in a little bit to, to some details. Um, the key bit here is that uh, all the demos that I have to show are from this library Moxie DOM, which is using this runtime to manage DOM nodes. But excuse me, uh, kind of one of the, the core the core thesis here is that these semantics and like being able to express uh, the shape of application in Rust could quite po easily port to other to other platforms. And like I have some, you know, some half-baked experiments with Windows and with Pathfinder and stuff like that, right? Um, so the, 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 the open road lies ahead. Uh, let's see if I can remember what slide this is. Oh, yeah, okay. So this is where I spent the last couple of weeks hacking instead of showing, uh, instead of you know, polishing my slides. Um, and also, a quick warning to anybody watching the video, this will likely possibly be live before the video of the RustConf one, so we're doing kind of a fun time traveling thing. Uh, the code that I'm not showing here is, you know, going to like be at a later publication. Um, anyways, so, uh, what are we showing first? We're gonna show the counter first. Very professional. 
Okay, so we, we do some like basic prelude. This is all WASM, by the way. Um, and the Rust's WASM toolchain is pretty sweet. Uh, so if we, uh, let's scroll out of this. Is this visible? Okay, cool. In back, awesome. Um, so, you know, basically, if, you're, if you've used like React hooks, this is probably the closest analogy to like the style here. Um, and these macros uh, are, you know, they're aware of their call site, basically. So if you, had a, if you had a second one here, these would be distinct state variables that you'd allocate. So you allocate some, some persistent state for your, uh, for your component here, and we format some, some text for it, and then we create a button, right? This button uh, has an event handler, and on, on the event handler being fired, it will update this state variable, this count, right? So when on fires, state will be incremented. Um, and then, of course, because you know we have to test lists and stuff, and like you want to have a couple of little things that will break for you if you do something dumb. Um, we have that. So this is moxie.rs. Let's make this bigger too. Uh, this is published from top of tree uh, from CI. There's a Discord you can join. Um, obviously, I hope that this can be a community space, um, but it's very early. Oh, there is a code of conduct. I will enforce the shit out of it. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder, Jane. Um, okay, so here's a counter, right? So, boom, one. How high can we count? I don't know. This is the pinnacle of modern UI development. That's, that, that seems good. Um, so yeah, that's the counter, right? Uh, I have many schemes to you know, make this nicer to write. I think uh, one of them is there's, there's already been an RFC approved for uh, a language feature that I think will make it possible to eliminate all the macros so you can just apply an annotation to any function and then it becomes topologically aware, which that's a phrase that I hope catches on to explain the weird stuff that I do. Um, and I will explain that in a minute. Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, that's, a, that's kind of the minimal example there, right? And this is, you know, in this, this scheduler in, behind this function call is a few hundred lines of code. And it, you know, it responds, it only runs code in, in response to actual state mutations. So not all events will cause the runtime to re-execute. Uh, and it does so like with fancy request animation frame based scheduling. So you shouldn't be blocking the main thread most of the time. Uh, it's integrated with the tracing crate. So soon I should be able to have like a tracing timing thing that'll tell you, you know, if you had like, a, if you blew your request animation frame budget, we can give you a breakdown of which parts of your component topology were causing that problem. Uh, things like that. So, uh, you know, it's very early days, but I think that there's some, you know, some promising stuff happening under the hood. Um, let's go back to some slides, yeah? Here's a video of the same thing. Do we want to watch it again? No. Uh, okay, so <coughs> decomposing the buzzword soup a little bit, right? A little code sample, a little demo. Um, Platform agnostic and lightweight, what does that mean? Well, it's Rust, so if you don't put platform in it, it just is, right? <laughs> this is a simplistic uh, explanation, but you know, basically the idea is that if you can define a bunch of the key semantics to share between all the libraries uh, in the lower level crates that don't know anything about a DOM or a tree or whatever, then you can reuse those in interesting places. Um, and, uh, since compilation times have been a subject of conversation recently, I would like to keep them fast, et cetera, but you know. Uh, oh, and also, I really, really, really wanna make this work without like a threading model or you know, if you just have an allocator, things like that. And I almost made it happen, but then it was gonna be a whole yak shave. Uh, and so that's for a future, a future revision. But like, I think it's very plausible that you could have some you know, kind of mid-range embedded thing that actually has some graphics to do that you could still use this, this runtime in it. Um, I haven't benchmarked it sufficiently to prove that out, but like it's plausible. Uh, so the other half of the catchphrase, um, declarative UI runtime, is not a phrase I think that anyone ever used until React like took over everyone's brains. Uh, you know the, the the pace at which it's become it or it, the concepts that it's popularized have become kind of the de facto way to describe new UI projects. I think is telling. Um, like I said, I don't actually write very many applications. I've done some web development um, and things like that, but 
the, the social proof seems very strong to me. And also there's some really nice technical problems, uh, technical properties, like not having to think about time when you write the description of your UI. Like it's just right now. Um, so before we get into like what that means in terms of an implementation or what we do or things like that, let's just talk about like the role of a UI runtime, right? Um, it's not like the application logic. It's responsible for, uh, oh, I'm not even presenting. There we go, cool. So uh, it's responsible for presenting a bunch of visual items, right? Uh, these are DOM nodes on the web. It's like you know a little sub canvas in some UI frameworks, right? A little rectangle. Uh, doesn't matter. It's tree things, right? They nest. And then the, the important person, the VIP, the human, does something. Or maybe something that they've asked to act on their behalf does something, like an I.O. driver or network uh, response. And that requires updates to the interface, right? So you have to change something on the screen. And this needs to be a, a magical lie of a continuous constant object, right? It should be a persistent thing. Uh, but computers don't really do persistent things, they do things in loops, right? They do the same thing in loop. Um, and uh, for UI, we usually talk about these being scheduled as frames, right? So that's kind of the, uh, the, the 10,000 foot view of what we're talking about. Um, this is like a very bad diagram of the like UI pipeline in like a traditional model view controller type thing. Uh, almost all of the applications up until like the React phenomenon just skyrocketed were written in a style where you would manually create this tree and you would write code that updated the state of the tree based on events, right? And so the UI description was kind of a property of like all of the accumulated mutations you'd made up until that point. Um, there's very good reasons to write UI this way. For one thing, it's a format that the computer understands, uh, like you can map it to the GPU. Also, like there's a lot of weird, sophisticated stuff that you end up having to do if you want to uh, describe it differently. Um, and so the key bit here is that you have something you know, that you're manually bringing through to the next frame, right? Uh, and the world has decided they would like to describe the state of the UI right now, you know, like this moment. Um, Imgui was really popular like six, seven years ago it, among game developers. Uh, this is, you know, very pleasant code compared to some big QT tree to manage, although QML is pretty cool, like everybody's doing the thing, right? Um, and this has some limitations because you have to like write directly to the GPU essentially, et cetera. Um, and some really smart people came along and they said, I don't know if this is actually the history, but they said, we would like to do this on the web. We have these DOM nodes, they require explicit mutation, but I would like to just kind of write HTML and have my application do it for me, right? Uh, and so they have you know, this state that they manage and they bring it along for you and then they do this reconciliation in the runtime, right? The runtime goes through and says like, ah, yes, I see that you would like to have this div appear here and it was not there before, I will create it for you. Um, and you get very cool things like you can essentially interleave what pretends to be HTML and your JavaScript and it works like that, right? Um, so I think if we want to go beyond that, or if we want to say like, where does Rust have a role to play in this kind of paradigm? Uh, I think it's basically, we just have to admit that Rust is harder to write than JavaScript. And then basically every other language that people actually want to write applications in, right? Like this is a space where serving Rustation's interests is an awesome achievement and I will be happy just to do that. But the potential that I see in our community and in our technology to go further than that, to kind of, you know, take over the world, uh, comes from just admitting like, oh, we've got to make this a little bit easier to match the domain, I think. But that also means we have an opportunity to find unique ways to invest Rust's properties. Like, so if you have to pay attention to allocations, right, like they show up in your syntax, that's not the case for lots of languages, uh, especially ones that people like to write nice sugary UI in then maybe there's a way that we can take those same properties and you know, achieve new interesting things, or at least achieve productivity that you would not find in a, a different environment, right? Uh, and of course, maximum portability. Um, so the basic idea here is both React and the MVC mutable object graph thing, except we have some tools for making all of our updates to that to that you know, stable tree incremental. Uh, and that's you know, 
broadly speaking, like people talk about it like caching or incremental computation. Moxie talks about it uh, in terms of memoization because it's at specific call sites for specific function invocations, um, as I showed you in the slide earlier. And so then this, this storage of memoized items comes across. <laughs> and how do we do this? How do we describe you know, things just like their HTML or something similar in, in line with our Rust code? God, it is hot in here. <laughs> wow. Yes, Bob, I will calm down. OK. Um, so if you squint, a function call graph, it's like a tree, right? <laughs> yeah, sure, OK. So let's do that. OK. Um, we have some functions here. Their names don't matter. Uh, let's pretend that indent is, we'll call it a topologically aware function. And it knows its depth in the function call tree, yeah? Uh, and it will, well, you know, like it says on the tin, indent the string that it's printing according to its depth in the tree. Um, so we have the root. Every time we enter a stack frame, we call a function, we create a node in this tree. This is like not concretely, we're not actually doing this. Don't worry, I'm not totally bonkers. Um, but this is kind of, this is conceptually the scopes we're creating and they have concrete identifiers in the runtime and, and so this is the tree construction. So we allocate a root node. Uh, it's not at any depth, it's at depth zero, so it doesn't get indented when it prints, and then it calls A. I know, this is extremely complex algorithmic computation. Uh, bear with me. We enter A's stack frame, we allocate a node in the tree, in the abstract tree, and aha, we've indented, yeah? Um, and similarly, we pop back out, go into B, creates a node, we have an indentation, enter a loop, call some other thing, has another side effect, uh, and you know if we if we extend this this concept, right? Control flow should just work. And I mean, I know it's slides, so we're not doing anything impressive. But um, you know, this is this is the thing we would want if we were just going to use function calls to describe a tree. We would just want the control flow to look like the tree, or the tree to look like the control flow. Depends on which direction you're squinting from. Uh, and so you know, we have C sub two, right? Um, and you can see kind of we. We've accumulated, this might be an abstract tree over here, but you can see that on the left in our, our fake console, we've accumulated side effects according to this function call that map to the structure of both the syntax and the execution, right? Um, and so this is, you know, this mapping from execution of function calls into some structure of side effects is the, the core bit that we're doing here. Um, I know that that's really out there. We'll, we'll talk more. Uh, so this tree, or this topology, is implemented in this crate underneath Moxie called Topo, very originally named. Um, and so the idea is kind of like, it's, it's making these stack frames and their position over time relative to other stack frames, right? It's because like if you, you have a stack you're pushing on and then you're kind of, you move over in time and then you put another one on. Um, we reify this notion in a concrete identifier, right? So you can call a function or inside your function at any time and say, where am I? Um, and that will be unique to your position in this, in this tree. The way we do this is we uh, essentially trace the path of these executions down, right? So when we call a function, it has an identifier. If there's no parent for it, like there's no topologically aware parent, it gets zero by default. So you can see the zero up there by the root. And then each time you enter a function, that call site for that function has unique identifier associated with it, right? So your, your function has, excuse me, its source location, but then where it's invoked has a unique source location as well. And so the ID represents those properties all hashed together, basically, right? Uh, and the important bit here is that if we do this, right, we build this tree walking these, these functions, we can do this in a loop. Hey, there's our UI runtime. Uh, and if we do that in the loop, those IDs will be stable across executions. So, you know, we call the loop once, we create the tree, we call the loop again. If the tree's changed, maybe we should do something. If the tree hasn't changed, that's a lot of work we can skip. Um, and so basically, uh, the Moxie crate takes this 
way of generating identifiers. Uh, and you know, it's paused, waits for events. When an event occurs, it calls the root closure you provide it, and then it goes to sleep again. Um, and so when it's calling this root, uh, we have some tools that create kind of you know, a runtime environment conducive to describing the UI. Um, small aside, if you know React, I mean, it's fairly popular, so I figure some people here will. Uh, th this like topologically aware functions maps very closely to React hooks, uh, except you can use them in conditionals and loops and recursion, and et cetera. Um, and uh, Moxie kind of maps onto React implemented with hooks in context, basically. Because Topo also has an environment that it can create, which is like scoped global variables. Um, and so, you know, we, we have these revisions or frames. Runtime gets invoked on each one. Uh, if we just naively create side effects, the runtime is very inefficient and much, much worse than anything you would actually build an application with today. So let's not do that. Um, and we have a few primitives for doing so. You can say, I would like this to happen once for this scope in my tree. I would like for this to happen anytime this variable changes from the previous invocation, right? That's the, the memoization. Um, and then you also, because these values are stored in kind of, you know, outside of your, your code, uh, just ready there waiting for you, we also have a single place at which we can garbage collect them if they weren't referenced in the last revision. Uh, and in Rust, you can implement drop-on types so that when they're destroyed, you can run arbitrary logic. And in this way, I think, you know, there's like some interesting paths to essentially moving into the language things that are normally UI framework concepts that you get implemented per framework. Um, you can build, you know, persistent state variables in the memoization store that, you know, take concrete updates and you can use this to build nice abstractions for the DOM so that, you know, things only rerun when the state changes, et cetera. Um, and so I've built a to-do MVC sample with this. I know it's very hot. To-do MVC and behold. So we can check things completed. We can delete tasks. We can add new tasks. This is like a year of work, so. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty stoked about it. Uh, <laughs> Of course, there, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, there are some, there are some provisos though, which is that like this doesn't actually do the memoization yet. So like the, the fact that this all works and isn't totally broken is because it's not yet memoizing because there's just that couple of bugs that I'm still, uh, still working out. Um, but all the pieces are there. And memoizations, the memoization storage and call site identification, et cetera, are necessary to uh, construct this. It's just, they're not being used to maintain the DOM tree across revisions yet. Um, but yeah, so you know, you can, oh, did I break it? No, I didn't break it. There we go. Um, you can you know, switch between active and completed. Da, 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 da. Okay, so that's all very boring. This is actually live online though, and it's running WebAssembly in your browser, and there's no JavaScript except, I think like a little shim trampoline thing to, where are we? Yeah, so here's this. So we have, oh no, that's, that's for development. That's not running. Oh yeah, here's the JavaScript. Yeah, so there, I lied, sorry. There's some JavaScript. Um, it's the wasm pack JavaScript plus an await. So everything else is Rust, that's pretty cool. Uh, and some CSS, you know, thermal stuff. Um, and so this is, this is the tree made by like this weird branch where the syntax that I've been showing is coming from. Um, and, you know, we have, uh, so some other things along with the project, just point out this is like a server that's running, have some cargo watch tasks. Um, oh. Shh. <laughs> the, the demo curse had to happen somewhere. It had to happen somewhere. Um, so, you know, we, like, we have some cargo watch based things and when files change, that server will, uh, you know, reload our tabs. So like if I were to break something, this might work. Here we go. So this is the root of the application. Um, let's change the default to do that it loads with. Okay. 
One thing about this workflow is that I have too many tasks stacked up in the watchers. We're compiling to do MVC now. Cool. So did that reload for us? No, it did not. Why did it not reload for us? Probably because file system notifications don't work very well when you start the watcher before suspending your laptop. Okay, well, the demo broke. That's expected. <laughs> uh, so let's look at how this is implemented a little bit, yeah? Um, here's you know, a little bit more complex state than a counter. If you've done JavaScript stuff, what we're doing here um, might be familiar is like a, a Redux atom, right? So like this is the root of the application. We have the state for the application, which is you know, the visibility and the list of to-dos that we're gonna mutate, right? Uh, and then we provide these as kind of you know, singletons to our environment. We create a div and we call some component functions or some, you know, some, some topologically aware functions, the header and main section there. Um, and if we you know, look in, like when we go and render the, the list of, of things, we have bunch of junk, 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 junk. Oh, and here, we have a for loop. Nice. And so that's how to-do items are rendered, is you know, we loop over a filtered iterator. Um, and I, if this isn't, uh, if you haven't done collections or filtering or things like that in like reactive UI systems, um, this seems like very obvious and boring. And if you've been in JSX land for years, you're like, ah. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you, trust me. Uh, and so this is kind of the basic structure of things, right? Um, there's some other possibly interesting stuff like in handling inputs can be a little weird, but it's not so bad. Um, you know, we create a placeholder and like have some DOM interactions. This is all using WebSys, by the way, which is fantastic. Um, and my favorite feature, Rust doc links to MDN for everything I would ever want to know about the web. It's like the fastest way I can find web docs. Um, you know, so like if we're having, having an input here, we have a couple of different events that we have to handle. Um, and so, you know, these, the, the Moxie DOM set up right now, the event handling in order to kind of guide you into doing less work uh, only handles events on state pointers, essentially, right? So you allocate a state variable and you say, here is a pointer to it. Please mutate it when the DOM has an, receives an event. Uh, and so, the, you know, you get some event and, uh, apply the, yeah, there you go. So you get provide a new value for this, uh, for the text input field, right? Uh, and similarly, like on a key press, we have some handling logic, you know, it's all pretty, it's all fairly boring. Uh, there's a little bit of state mismatching stuff with the DOM here that I need to sort out, but I don't think it's uh, nothing too bad. Um, so this is like code that works and does stuff uh, and it's fun, uh, but it's like not very much. Here's another, oh, I, that was what I showed you. Well done, good remembering, Adam. Here's a video. Yes, me, yeah, I didn't do a very good demo, so let's, you know, we'll, we'll watch this. So uh, if, if the internet agrees, yeah. Um, so, you know, this is like very, very boring. Um, I did demo Moxie at RustConf. That's good. Didn't want to forget that. Um, yeah, okay, that's enough. So where are we today? Why am I talking? It's not working, it's very broken, it's very early. Well, I would like to take Jane's advice, now that I've heard it all in one list, uh, and I was kind of heading in that direction. Um, there needs to be more people working on UI stuff in Rust if we want to build applications. That's just a fact. Uh, I am one person who has a day job. I actually kind of like the stuff that I'm working on right now. So like I'm not, you know, charging full into this like full time. I'd like to have evenings occasionally. So I've got to find other people. <sighs> I have to do the thing that got me into this community in the first place. The thing that like helped me grow as a professional and like brought lots of new perspectives to me. And you know, okay. So actually I'm pretty excited to like encourage people to come contribute. Please come contribute. Um, but with the, with the proviso, proviso that like it's pretty mature, you know, I think there's some good ideas, or at least interesting, worth examining before abandoning. 
Um, you know, performance is unknown. I think there's a path to making it wicked fast, but I haven't started that at all. Um, documentation and testing is very early, although I've been doing more on that since I wrote these slides originally. Uh, syntax is improving, but there's no JSX, and um, I would really, really like typed HTML to integrate nicely. I haven't started hacking on that. Uh, presumably, I will pester Bodle at some point. Um, but I think that's kind of one of the things that I find exciting about the Rust ecosystem, at least, is, you know, Here's, here's this developer experience I have in mind. I would like to take a declarative UI runtime and I would like to write my syntax for it matching the platform I'm targeting. And this doesn't have to be one monolithic crate, right? This doesn't have to be coupled things. Um, and we don't even need language support, like it's all just there. So that's cool, that's a cool thought. Um, I'm not gonna build cross-platform elements for this until somebody else does, probably. Uh, I think like there's just a lot of work to be done making it possible to build Rust apps with a particular platform in mind. And eventually we will get to a point where it's easy to take the abstractions from those and just kind of hoist them into libraries. Um, and yeah, there's nothing built for it that's not in this talk. So, you know, just temper, temper expectations. Uh, there's like a bajillion and a half things to do. I would love your help. I turned the sound off on this because I didn't know how, I didn't have a chance to do a volume check, but it's a pretty great song. If you want to hear the Crab Rave song. Um, yeah, I think that's like what the future of UI could look like, potentially. Just, just think, just think. Uh, so yeah, moxie.rs, here's the website. Um, that QR code goes to the Discord. I still get push notifications for every join and every message. It gives me so much dopamine. Uh, and I would love to share that experience. Uh, and if you would like, I will take questions if we don't all want to run into the evening heat, or evening cool from the heat. <laughs> you can tell I'm cooked. Thanks. Do we have? I've not written much React, but my understanding is that in React, the persistence of states across frames is dependent on basically the details of the virtual DOM diffing algorithm, or the, compo or the component diffing algorithm, rather. Mm -hmm. um, sort of. Like there's, there's you know, component state, and then there's the runtime state. So I'm talking about component state, actually. Sure. So I'm saying okay. like the choice of whether to reinitialize a component state or yes. to reuse it from the previous one yes. is dependent on the diffing algorithm, yes. right? Does this have the same property? No. So how is state, how is component state if there is such a thing? There is not such a thing. So then what was that state macro? A state variable. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, okay, so I had a component trait, and in fact, when the video from RustConf comes out and embarrasses me thoroughly, uh, I have some syntax in the slides that has like, here's a component trait, here's how you implement it. My experience implementing just a couple of things quickly turned out to be like, yeah, you just want functions. Um, and this is also incidentally the direction that a friend of mine who works on Jetpack Compose a couple of months ago like nudged me on and was like, we're doing this. Like component abstractions are overhead important for certain things but not for your thing. And I found him to be convincing. Um, but much after he tried to convince me. So thanks Leland. Uh, so as a result of that, it's like, functions and their variables. And some of those variables happen to be memoizable. Some of those variables happen to be mutable, but out of band with the current execution, right? Like by handing it off to an event handler. Uh, and those are the primitives of the runtime, that's it. So like if you, I don't have it, I don't, I don't have nested memoization working yet. So if you want to like skip internal portions of the tree, it only works on leaf nodes right now. Um, but once I have dependency tracking for those, it should be pretty straightforward, and then you'll be able to just like say, well, if this variable hasn't changed, don't rerun those functions. And then those side effects will be memoized as a result because we'll have stuck their structs representing that having been done into the memoization store with the drop handler to undo their effects later, right? That, sorry, I rambled a lot there. But the, there's no like component trait, there's no like, hosted state from the runtime. The diffing, in fact, is done entirely in the leaf nodes that mutate the host environment. Like, there's no, there's no, there's no, 
I guess technically there is a diffing and it's in memo, which is to see if the memo capture variable has changed. That's the diffing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any more confusing answers to give? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying hard, I'm sorry. Do you have a question? Hi there. I'm wondering what the uh, yeah, sure. what feedback you got at RustConf regarding the declarative style in this model. Like when you look at other frameworks that um, venture to go into de declarative UIs, including I think one of the most recent ones is uh, Svelte. I think it's pronounced uh, by um, Rick Harris, I believe, mm -hmm. and he decides inspiration also by like a, a guy named Paul and and the idea that you have like this quote unquote destiny operator which uh, takes the role of uh, your state annotations, so as opposed to saying state exclamation mark, and then you say this is the variable that is going to be uh, maintaining, that is supposed to be um, always shown in the UI. Um, instead of having that, having a specific operator that says whatever you're operating on in this sp specific variable, it ought to be always displayed up to date to the user. And seeing what you've done, I was wondering if people at RustConf men mentioned something along those lines saying, well, there is the notion of declarative programming, not just in the, in the world of UI, but in general. Um, but to deal with that, you have to really rethink the, the notion of what, what an assignment operator is. It really changes a lot. So I'm wondering if anyone picked up on that or what the type of discussions you had in, in that space were, if any. So I had a brief interaction with Rick about Svelte a while ago um, on Twitter, maybe. I don't remember. Um, and I actually think that, I think that the model I saw him talking about when I watched his talk seems pretty similar actually to, to Moxie where like under the hood it's just poking at mutable stuff mediated by some nice sugar for it. Um, I think, yeah, I mean an, a, an assignment operator for a state variable sounds great. I, I suspect that it will be a while before our approaches, our meaning the Rust community's approaches, have matured enough for that to go into the language. And in the meantime, I think it's pretty cool that we have the ability to do this with macros and annotations and things like that to the extent that we can. Also, I'm kind of interested in exploring this space of like achieving very declarative syntax without breaking mental models, right? Like, I'd like the guts of it to kind of be bare. Not because I think that that's like morally virtuous, but because I think that, you know, shifting intuition is just hard. And the way people debug is a certain way. And so I think that the, like having kind of top-down imperative control flow where you can reason very, very directly about the execution order of things in this description of the UI, I think there's actually value in that, value in that. especially when you consider that uh, it's, very straightforward to make like life cycle operations happen with drop handlers, right? Like I think you can actually do declared UI, but you know, down and dirty imperatively essentially uh, with Rust. And so I think that's kind of like the angle that I'm looking at right now. Uh, that said, yeah, I mean, I think most frameworks lust for language support and UI is a difficult domain and I wouldn't like, rule that out as something to do in the future? Have I, have I answered your question? Yeah. Okay, cool, yes. <laughs> All right. uh, I've been informed that we're gonna keep it to a limited number of questions. Should we cap it here? Yeah, I mean, uh, feel free to mob him later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll hang out for a few. Um, and also, there's, you know, the Discord, QR codes, very 2011. Uh, sorry, 2019. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, but I'll, I'm here, come pester me. I'm online, come pester me. If you email me at, I just set this up, lol at anp dot lol. Um, <laughs> I will schedule coffee with you or chat. Um, and I, I am a bit time constrained, so I haven't signed up for Jane's awesome mentorship list, but within my little realm, I am of course very available and uh, would love to, to offer direction or opinion or whatever if you're interested but not sure where to start. And thank you very much for listening to me talk for this long. Um, thanks, Adam.
And uh, we still have some time, so feel free to hang around, talk. Uh, you can ask the speakers any questions you still had. And um, as, as always, if you have any ideas for talks, uh, let me know. You can message me on Meetup. Um, thank you again for coming.